Good evening, church family. How are we doing tonight? Good. Um, I have a couple quick announcements, and then I'll go into my thought, and then we'll take offering. But uh, first announcement, um, if we have any visitors for the first time, please fill out a Connect card. Uh, we want to get to just send you a note, get to know you a little bit better. Uh, as Pastor says, we promise no one's going to show up at your house with a weird casserole. Uh, we just want to get to know you and really connect with you, and thank you for coming. Um, Conroe Youth is going to Raising Cane's following tonight's service. Um, it's going to be a great way to, to hang out with youth. Uh, parents, if your youth's here, please let them go. It's going to be fun. Pastor said his family's going, and I think that, honestly, we can pack out Cane's tonight and just let it be a church time of fellowship. Can I get an amen? Uh, singing outing at McKenzie's Barbecue. Um, it's going to be a gospel singing Sister Ramsey's putting on. Uh, if you'll get with her, I'm not sure when this is. It's going to be Friday night at 6 a.m. It says right here. Uh, but get with her regarding tickets, and she can get you taken care of. Everybody say church merch. Church merch. We now officially have church merch, and we're doing a big push for church merch to get uh, in coming up into our Sunday service of August the 6th for our back to school bash. Uh, we'll be doing some great things, praying over our kids as they go back to school. As the world gets darker, God's light is going to shine greater. And I really believe that. And I, I want us to be in prayer for that service uh, because we're going to have a ton of people in this room that can really be affected and can really be touched. Not only students, but teachers. Maybe there's parents who are struggling sending their kids into a public school setting. And just that the peace of God would be in that room that we can really touch those teachers and those parents and even those kids as they go in to school. Really quick, I have a short thought called the value of a name change. It's based off of Genesis 16 through 21, and it's talking about the name change of Abram and Sarai. Abram was promised in Genesis 16 that he was going to have a son that was going to lead to a multitude that where they couldn't even count because they would be as of the dust of the de of, of the sand of the desert. But we all know that in Genesis 17, him and Sarai, Sarai took their, or in 16, they took their hands, they took the promise of God into their own hands and had a child with Hagar and, and led to Ishmael and all the things that inspired from that one. But in Genesis 17, God comes back on the scene and he takes back control of the situation. When Abraham, Abram at that point said, I know what I'm doing and I'm going to do it my way, God said, but wait, I've got the final say. In Genesis 21, or in 17, God changes their name and speaks to Abram and calls him Abraham and Thou shalt not call Sarai, Sarah anymore, but she'll call her Sarah. But I couldn't help but think the grace of God covers a multitude of sins. So my question is, what is the outcome of your name change? Maybe you've been in church all of your life. Maybe you were like me. You were raised on a pew, on a church pew. Maybe there was a promise that you feel was lost long ago. Maybe there was a passion that you had for the kingdom, but now it feels like there's nothing there, like you're barren, as was Sarah's womb. But I guarantee you that the promise is still there, and I guarantee you that the passion is still there. But on the, same, on the other side of that hand, maybe this is your first service in an apostolic or a Pentecostal church. Let me be the first person to introduce you to the forgiveness and to the grace and the mercy that, that lives in the love that Jesus has for each and every single one of us. Give him the sins that you have come in here tonight, the burdens, the cares, the worries, the stresses, the anxiety, the depression, and lay them at the altar. And let him wash the sins, all the worries, all the cares away. 
and let him create a new life in you as he did in those two. Now, whether you're on one extreme or whether you're on the other or whether you're somewhere in the middle, I guarantee you that tonight is a night that it can come true for you. Don't let another service goes by that we don't partake in what God has for us. Another day where the passion is not alive in you. Maybe it's a passion for kids, for teaching the kids, or maybe it's a passion for just helping in the maintenance of the church. Let that passion burn bright again because there is something for each and every single one of us to do. I promise you. Quickly, if the ushers could come, we'll go ahead and take the offering tonight. But don't let the passion or the burden that you have fall by the wayside. We've all made mistakes. I've made them. Don't let the passion, the burden that you have cause you to lose out. Cause, don't let the passion, the burden you lose because of the mistakes that you made. Because there's grace and mercy every single day for every single sin and everything that you've done can be covered. For we serve an amazing God. Right now, let's go to prayer for the offering. Lord Jesus, we come before you right now. We ask that you would touch this offering. We ask that you would touch those that have to give and those that do not. Oh God, you see every amount of sacrifice. God, I pray that you would bless, oh God. I pray that you would multiply for your kingdom and for your glory. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. When you've given all that you can give and you're out of, you've emptied your purse and your billfold, you can be seated. If you don't do that, keep standing with me tonight. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad that you're here this evening. We are in the middle of the summertime. It's hot, and, um, but God is good to us. He's blessing us, and I'm so thankful that each of you are, are here tonight. Amen. The Lord is, uh, I'm so like... When you see somebody like Sister Primo, who just was so sick a few days ago, and she's running around here. Now, I'm going to tell a little secret about Sister Primo. And she, they, they brought the, the, the physical therapy people to her room and told her to walk on a walker. Well, she was running around so fast on the walker, they had to put a restraint on her, and they were pulling her back. And they came back the next day and said, we're going to do this without the walker. They put the restraint on her, and they were still having to pull her back. And she said she had too much to do to be sick, and so I'm so thankful the Lord is helping her and touching her. Amen. Literally, you don't have a stroke and lose half of your, lose one side and then be running around like she's running around now. And I heard that she's trying to sneak around and drive a little bit, so y'all just uh, let her go. Get out of her way and let her go. Amen. So glad everybody's here tonight. Uh, I want to say hello. Mandy went out. This is Sister Jace, and they're little, they're little human, so we're so thankful that, that they're here. And they've, they've moved. Uh, Jace is back, and she's coming, and so praise the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tonight, I want to talk to you from this thought, the prison of an unforgiven debt. The prison of an unforgiven debt. Matthew chapter 6. Let's read the Lord's Prayer together. Let's, let's do this out loud. Our Father, with, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I want to read a portion of this uh, to you from the Amplified. And that verse of Scripture says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The Amplified says that this way, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven, left them behind, remitted, and let go of the debts and have given up resentment against our debtors. 
resentment against our debtors. Now, we, we, we don't mind talking about forgiving the debts, but we kind of want to hang on to that resentment part. Is there a witness in the house? So I want to talk tonight briefly about the prison of an unforgiven debt. And when we, we look at the Lord's Prayer, and we just had a series on this, what, a few months ago. But when you look at the Lord's Prayer, it ends with a series of um, worship and, and request. And couched in the very middle, right in the middle of this prayer, there's a clause, though, that, that trumpets a different sound. And it's placing a responsibility upon you and I as, as, we, as we pray that prayer. And um, it's, it's simply this, we ask and, we're asking our debts or our shortcomings to be forgiven. Listen, you wouldn't have a debt if you didn't have a shortcoming. I mean, you pull the credit card out to buy something because you don't have the cash. You're a little short on the cash, so you do to the credit so that you have created a debt. You think you need that $50,000 new pickup because the, 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 the $40,000 pickup that you drive is just not good enough anymore, so you trade it in and you create a, a debt because you're, you're short. And so forgive us our, our shortcomings as, as we also have forgiven others. So he's asking that we find forgiveness but I've learned a secret, that forgiveness that we seek and we receive is in direct proportion of that forgiveness that we have offered. There comes a time when, when you may be slow to offer, offer or forgive, but there's going to come a time when you need that same forgiveness. And if you have lavished that forgiveness upon people, if you have poured that out upon people, when it's your turn, you can rest assured. You will be stunned when people forgive you. You will be stunned when people forgive those debts and forgive those shortcomings. You'll wonder why it's happening, but you'll get through that wonder and you'll look back and realize, I am so thankful that I was careful to forgive the shortcomings of others. And, and you may not even have realized in the process you were doing that. But I promise you, if you don't find the mercy of others in your life, there's a good chance, good chance that you didn't offer mercy what was within your power to offer that mercy. So in talking about this tonight, it's, it's important that we accept the personal responsibility for our own forgiveness. Well, have you ever... If you, the spouses are wonderful with this. And I'm not talking about if it's a, a he spouse or a she spouse. But spouses are good about this. And they'll say, well, I have apologized and you have to forgive me. You ever been in that discussion with some human who said, you got to forgive me? There are humans who are masters at manipulating you against, uh, manipulating your goodness against you. Because they know if you're a Christian, you have to forgive. So they will, before they make anything right, they're going to they're gonna say they apologize. And since they've apologized, you are bound to forgive. And, and there are those who are quite capable at manipulating, malipul, malip, <laughs> it's manip, not malip, <laughs> manipulating. Your ethics and your integrity and your Christianity. But it doesn't matter. Even in those moments, we have to accept the responsibility of our own forgiveness. And even if they are playing you, accept the responsibility and let it go. Let it go. Because sometimes, you know, we find ourselves, we're not wanting to forgive and we're not wanting to have peace. We're wanting revenge. Now, you related to that. There was a lot of response about that revenge stuff. Because we, we, don't, we, we, we don't want to forgive and let it go. We, we, you know, we may, we you know God, God owns all the revenge. He claims it. Vengeance is mine, he says. He'll let you play with all, he'll let you have all the vengeance and revenge you want. But you better be careful. 
because it belongs to him. And I'd a whole lot rather him have the revenge and him have the vengeance than me have to deal with that in my own spirit. I found out something about revenge. When I get a little revenge, that doesn't satisfy. I want more revenge. It's like the old hound dog who gets in the chicken shed next door, gets his first chicken. And you think, well, it was just a one-time thing. No, if that, if that dog ever gets that taste of blood, he'll never stop getting. Now, I'm showing you my very educated lifestyle now. I'm telling you, a dog that gets in the chicken shed tastes that blood. He's never satisfied till he tastes the blood again. And if you ever have the blood of your brother or the blood of your friend or the blood of someone, you ever taste that, you'll not be satisfied until you have that again. That's an ugly place to be. Let God have the revenge and the vengeance. Let him have it. And you'll find the peace of God that passes all understanding. You see, if I want forgiveness, I've got to recognize that to receive such, I must offer it first. How can we, how can we argue that woman that was caught in adultery how can we argue the fact that she was guilty? There was, there was much evidence against, against her, and the men were standing there ready to, to take care of, of the vengeance and, and, and the things that were, the justice that was available in their political system. But when Jesus says those words, let he that is without sin cast the first stone. Let he that hasn't failed, let he that is without sin, who among us, has not failed. Who among us hasn't failed? Now, we don't like this part, but the fact is, is every one of us has fallen short. Every one of us has messed up. There is more wordy dirge, more, more filthy language has been said in anger in this room than we'll ever admit. Amen. Because we we are flesh, we are carnal. And when we are not seeking the Lord and not prayed up, we're very apt to respond in a wrong way. Romans 3 and 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's another scripture that says, when you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Be careful that your pride doesn't push you to the point to make you feel like you're above some failures. None of us are above failures. None of us have escaped failure in the past, and none of us are so righteous and so holy that we can escape failure now. Amen. There is, there's a doctrine that, that some teach called the doctrine of predestination. And in some of they, what, they, what they've taught now for, like, like six or eight hundred years, this doctrine that you are, if you are predestinated of God, that, that, that you are chosen to be saved, and no matter what you do, you can't be unsaved. I mean, and, and this, is, this, this, this is this doctrine of predestination, and you don't know if you've been predestinated or not, so it's in your interest to try to act saved. But even if you are predestinated and you're, you know, you're, quote, saved, no matter what you do, you can't get unsaved. And then if you're one of those that's not chosen, it doesn't matter what you do, you can't get saved. That's a mess. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need to be very careful that when we think we stand, we need to be careful because we are just apt to fall. We are just apt to fail. In 1 Peter verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 18, I want to read them and, and look at a couple of them. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as you, are, as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on his behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now I'll stop there. There comes a moment that you've got to face the realities of what's going on in your world. And judgment begins at the house of God. There's sometimes you've just got to get to the house of God, get to the presence of God, get yourself into the altar of God, whether the altar is in this house or in your house, and you get to the presence of God and you get yourself in the altar of God and you ask God for that mercy and forgiveness because you've got to get to the presence of God to find that mercy and grace. Amen. And you're not apt to find that mercy and grace if you haven't been passing out and uh, uh, sharing it in the way. But judgment begins at the house of God. And so there's a moment that you've got to get yourself right into the house of God. And you've got to, as, as one place in the scripture says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Sometimes you've got to get face to face with God and work some things out. You got, sometimes you have to bury your face in the carpet and, and pray to him, cry out to him at the top of your lungs and ask him for his mercy. You've got to work out your own salvation. You might have to straighten some things out. You may have to forgive some folk. You may have to, you may have to make restitution with someone. You may, ha- you may have to make things right, but you've got to work your own salvation out with carefulness. It's on you. It is absolutely upon you. You see, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost is being told by by Peter, and he he says these words, save yourself from the untoward generation. In other words, the day we live in is a mess. Can you agree with that? And we think the days are are getting worse all the time. But, But here's the thing, is we live in an untoward generation. We live in an upside down world. We live in a day that's so filled with confusion. I mean, there's so much confusion out there. Who would have ever thought that that God made two genders, but we got it so messed up, we got 500 genders. Who ever thought we would live in a day? This is an untoward generation. This is, this, is, this is underworld. Uh, God made us what we are, but, but he somehow has allowed us to become, uh, if we choose, to become non-binary. Well, we, we don't know what we are. We can just be whatever we choose to be. That's not the way it is. But the scripture says we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And then we also have to be careful that we make sure we save ourselves from an untoward generation. Well, pastor, you mean I can save myself? Well... You can throw yourself at the foot of at the cross. You can ask for the mercy of Jesus Christ. You can, you can pray until you pray into the Spirit. You can pray until you get a renewing in the Holy Ghost. You can pray and seek the face of God until the dirty, filthy, unrighteousness of your flesh is washed away. And you can be renewed and restored in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. No, you you can't offer yourself grace, but you can't avail yourself of the grace of Jesus Christ. You can't forgive yourself, but what you can do is you can ask for the mercies of God and you can step into his presence and you can can bury your face in in, in an altar of contrition and you can weep your way into the presence of God and you absolutely can get yourself saved from the mess of this world that we live in. So... When you understand this, uh, you understand that there is a lot of garbage in this world. A lot of garbage. There's too much garbage in this world. Romans chapter 5, verses um, uh, 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many men were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So think about this. The first man, Adam, sinned brought sin to all of us, an original sin, the first sin that has been transferred to every generation. We are by nature, we have a sin nature in our flesh. So by one man's disobedience, we were all made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And so the first Adam, 
The first Adam entered into sin and passed that on to the next generations. But that second man, Adam, Jesus Christ, the actions of that one, by submitting himself to the cross and taking on our sins as that perfect sacrifice from the foundations of the earth, when he, when he gave himself and sacrificed that way, one man's disobedience caused all this trouble, but another man's obedience provides a pathway to get it fixed. Amen. And so understanding that, when the law entered, uh, it was so that offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So no matter how bad the sin, no matter what an abundance of sin might be in this day we live in or in your life, there is more than enough grace to take care of whatever unrighteousness you have found yourself locked into. I mean, if you're locked into a habit, if you're locked into an addiction, if you're locked into something that's immoral, if you're locked into something that brings shame to your life, there is more than enough grace. There is more than enough blood of Jesus Christ to cover your life and your heart and your spirit. Where sin did abound, grace does much more abound. When you understand when you understand that, that I'm going I'm to be kind and I'm going to forgive and I'm going to forgive those debts, uh, I'm going to place myself in a place where I can literally, literally be forgiven and I can step and walk into the Holy Ghost and I can be restored and refilled in the Holy Ghost. There comes a place that we absolutely, we absolutely can find the mercies of God in our lives. You want mercy? Show mercy. Matthew 18 and 21. Then Peter said unto him, came unto them and said, Lord, how often shall I sin, shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. So in his human, in Peter's human concept, do I forgive somebody for this thing seven times? And Jesus said, no, you forgive him 70 times seven. So the people that keep, do you have anybody in your life that keeps score? I mean, people that just, <laughs> they just keep score. And they, they never forget. They, they, just, they just keep a score. Now, making sure it stays fair. We all have somebody like that. At all. If you're that somebody, then we're just praying for you too, okay? But Peter says, do I forgive him seven times? And the Lord said, no. You forgive him 70 times, seven times. So that even works in the benefit of the, uh, that even works in the benefit of, of the scorekeeper. So now I, I, I have got to forgive you 490 times. How many of y'all been married more than 490 days? If you've been married more than 490 days, you've been given the opportunity to forgive. But if you're keeping score and you say, okay, today is the last day I got to forgive and tomorrow is day 491 and I'm getting mine tomorrow. That's not what the Lord was saying. The Lord was trying to hand to them a concept and a principle that, that your mercy your mercy, your forgiveness that you offer to others doesn't need to be seven times nor 70 times seven times, but it needs to be multiplied because there's going to come a day you want mercy multiplied coming your direction. And so you better be willing to offer multiplied mercies going outward because there's coming a day you're going to need multiplied mercies coming inward. He, 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 the Lord wanted the principle to be out there that there's untold numbers of opportunities that you're going to have to show mercy and kindness and grace to others. Because if you don't, when it's time for you to receive it, you're not going to receive back that same amount of multiplied mercies. So the Lord says, no, you, you forgive him. You, you forgive him 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king which took into account his servants. And when he had begun to 
reckon one was brought unto him that owed him 10,000 talents. For as much as he could not pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. But the servant fell down. He fell down before, and he worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. The same servant then went out without the load of debt. He had a $10,000 credit card just paid off and blessed him. The same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. He had been forgiven 10,000 talents, but his fellow servant owed him a hundred pence. Perspective, let's make a talent a dollar. He was forgiven $10,000. He found a fellow servant that owed him a hundred pence. Doesn't pence kind of sound like cents? Somebody owed $10,000 and was forgiven. Somebody owed the forgiven guy $1. That's the perspective we're talking about here. The same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a dollar and laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. But he would not and went and cast him to prison till he should pay that debt. Something's wrong here. Something's messed up here. Because God has forgiven us for so much. And we have the hardest time. We have the hardest time forgiving a brother that only owes us a dollar. We have the hardest time. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Now, I don't know that. I can find any way to justify them being tattletales, but I can justify this in the scripture. When the fellow brothers saw what he had done, understand this, people are going to see the way you acted. And everybody's going to know that you had filed bankruptcy because you couldn't pay that $10,000 and it got forgiven. But when you found somebody owed you a dollar and you acted crazy and grabbed the guy by the throat and made him go to prison, the folks around you were going to know. Let me tell you something. We don't judge. We're not to be judges. But we as Christians are going to know folks by their fruit. And it's not, our, it's, not our, it's not our duty to pass judgment on that, but it is our innate nature to recognize the fruit. And we notice. People know. So in this story, you find that this fella, he was, he was, it was going to cost him more than he could ever imagine in the arena of public opinion. Can you believe that guy got forgiven $10,000 and that little fella owed him a dollar? He was so rude. The, the court of public opinion can be tough. And so as a result of this, when his Lord, this is verse 32 now, when his Lord, after had called this man in and said to him, you're a wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt because thou asked me to. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay off all that was due him. So likewise shall our heavenly Father do unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. You want judgment in your life? Just don't forgive. And like Sister Martin says, when the Lord whips, he don't use no switch. Have any of ever you been, ever been, have you ever been beat with God's club? I mean, just sitting like the Lord just pounding in you and just, just spanking the fire out of you because he's trying to drive that foolishness. I mean, you act, you acting crazy over a dollar when he's done 10,000 miracles in your life. 
So there is a prison of unforgiven debt. There's a prison. And simply put, there are tormentors in that prison. And I want to quickly throw these out at you. Because when you have an unforgiven debt and you're going through the process now of, 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 of being in this prison, there's a thing called regrets, that you're going to be steeped in regrets. Why didn't I just forgive? I knew better. Pastor told me I should do better. I knew that was wrong. Regrets. And while you're in that jailhouse of, 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 of unforgiveness, bitterness can easily rise up. Resentment and bitterness and angst. Angst isn't a real fancy word, but every one of you understand it because it just sounds. When you say angst, it just kind of gets a kind of a dirty feeling when you say it. Because when someone has angst, it's just, it's just that yucky feeling from someone. You know what I'm talking about. You won't never admit that you've had it, uh, but, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because it's that angst. And, but in that prison, it also is loneliness, being separated from the presence of God, friends and family. Along with that comes sadness, depression, and a myriad of other things that are, that are just right there, right there in the middle, in the middle of an unforgiven situation. So I want to tell you a story about a sports player. And something that, that moved me, moved me deeply. Uh, you may well remember the name Oral Hershiser. Oral Hershiser was a, was a pro uh, major league baseball pitcher in the 90s. And even, even you know, in the late 80s and 90s, he, he pitched uh, for 18 years. But um, in, his, in his book, Between the Lines, he tells a story of, of, of how he became injured in the sport. And he was a persistent, he was persistent. And he, he got tagged by Tommy Lasorda as, as a bulldog. And that became, that became his nickname on, on the ball field. But in, in the 1990 season, Mr. Hershiser began to feel pain in his shoulder. And, and at this point, uh, when this day happens, uh, he had won 99 games uh, as a pitcher in baseball. He won 99 games. And then when he, he began to feel this pain, and it, it went on for a few days, and when he would throw the ball, he would literally feel this screech of pain. And, and his, his fastball was like 95 miles an hour, and he would throw it. And every time he threw it, it, it turns out that, it turns out that when he was throwing the ball, he had damaged his, the muscles in his rotator cuff. And when he threw the ball literally, when they finally did the MRIs on his shoulder, he was literally, the ball of his shoulder was coming out of the socket every time he threw the ball. And then it would pop back in. And he was in excruciating pain, but, but he, kept, he kept playing. He, he, was, he was extremely successful. And finally, one day in the midst of game when he threw the ball, it, it, he threw it and it didn't pop back in and he grabbed his shoulder and was just screaming in pain. And he tells a story that all he could hear was his wife in the stands screaming at the coach, pull him out, he's hurt himself, pull him out, he's hurt himself. So they pulled out, Mr. Hershiser out of the game and they took him and, and uh, these were early days of orthoscopic type surgery. Technology hadn't advanced like it had been. And generally in those days when you became injured in a sport, that was kind of the end of your career. You didn't really, you didn't get muscles and tendons fixed. And so, so uh, the doctor, rec the team doctor recommended that, that he go to surgery immediately. And in their minds, it was going to be the end of, the end of his career. But this doctor says, I'm going to do something that's very, very different. He said, I can tell. I'm going to share with you some statements of this doctor. The surgeon said these words. He said, you have been in extreme amounts of pain. And uh, it's time for you to, to stop resisting and let go and allow me to reconstruct your shoulder. Reconstruct your shoulder, uh, uh, Sister Ramsey. Reconstruct your shoulder surgery. It was, it was new. It was new at this time. And, and, and it really hadn't happened with sports players. And so this doctor said, you must trust me 
with this surgery. You've got to let control go, and you've got to trust me with this surgery. He says, you're going to, you, you, you don't need therapy, and you don't need medicine. You need to let me go inside your shoulder and literally rebuild your shoulder. Let me rebuild it. Now, this was scary in those days because uh, we hear reconstructive surgery all the time, but it wasn't, it wasn't they didn't have the technology and, and the lasers and all that we've got now. They didn't, they didn't have that all then. But then the doctor gives this reassurance. He said, if you will trust me and let me rebuild your shoulder, when this is over with, you will be better than you were before. It was unheard of. And so Mr. Hershiser had no, had no choice really but to allow surgery to, to get rid of the pain. Then the doctor says, in, in this surgery, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix the shoulder. And then when I get it repaired, then I'm going to go. And I'm going to make some strategic cuts in the other muscles and tendons around, around the wound and around the repair. He said, what I'm going to do there is I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do some strategic cuts because what I want to do is, is I, I, I want to be able to shape the scar tissue when you come out of this surgery. You're going to have scar tissue. But because I'm going to strategically put some little nicks, uh, I'm going to control where the scar tissue is going. And you're going to be better than new. So they went through the surgery. He came out, and it came time to begin therapy. And the advice of the doctor was this. Every day you'll spend X amount of time in the shower, in the hot, hot water. And what you're going to do then is you're going to, well, as you go around, you're going to be kind of braced. You're going to, this arm is going to be elevated all the time. But when you get in the shower, what you're going to do is you're going to get that water beating down on your body as hard as you can and on your shoulder. And then as you as you are in that shower, you are going to hold that arm up and you're going to lean into the scar. So you're going to hold it up and you're going to lean into it. And when it hits the pain point, you're going to go past the pain. And you're going to press into it and you're going to do it every day. And you're going to press past. And when I begin to read this, it dawned on me, that's what forgiveness is like. Sometimes, you can have the mercies of God in your life. You can have all the forgiveness you can imagine. You can have so many blessings in your life, but still we feel those things rise up in our spirit. Anybody? Anybody? But this is real. This is good teaching stuff now, okay? I mean, this won't make you shout. You won't shout tonight, but if you pay attention to this, you just might break out and run the aisles come Sunday, all right? You might fool around and show up at Monday night prayer meeting if you'll work on this little situation. I mean, you might even say, Pastor, you got to start having church on Sunday night again. It's so good. You might be one of those kind of, you might even put five fish on the back of your car, two big ones for you and mom and three little ones for all your kids. Because if you'll work on this, it'll transform your life. You got to learn to be able to be willing to go past the pain of the circumstances that have come into your life. And you've got to be willing to lean into them and then not just lean into them, but to go through them and beyond them. And as it, it, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. But if you lean into it, you'll get over this thing. A few years ago, I decided I was going to go to the gym every day. I did it. I mean, um, I've, I've gotten victory over that, all right? I have overcome that need and that desire. <laughs> that was a work of my flesh. Now I'm just all spirit and... But, um, you know, I've, you know, I've probably read and heard me talk about the de demon elliptical machine, but I got in this time that I decided I was going to, they had this little thing, I crawl up on a box and grab this and kind of do these safe kind of, you know, chin-ups. And uh, I got to where I could do two in a row. I was really making progress. <laughs> you liked that one, didn't you? <laughs> one day uh, I stepped off that step and, and something happened in his shoulder. It froze. It froze. And uh, it hurt. I didn't dare tell anybody. I just withdrew from that part of the, the gymnasium. 
I went back to the elliptical machine because that was just legs. It wasn't nothing to do with arms. They just hang on for the ride. But it got to where that I couldn't, uh, going down the road, I couldn't reach over and touch the seat by me. I'm not going to tell anybody that. It got to where in my closet, uh, I couldn't reach up. There was two rolls of clothes. I couldn't reach up there and take a hanger because this arm didn't go there no more. Anybody relate to this? Uh, I, I, my arm only went here anymore, and I wasn't going to confess it to anybody. And, and so I was doing everything left-handed, and, and, but it got to where it was, my wife started noticing it, and it got to where that it's frozen. It got to where it was frozen. And so I was afraid that they're going to have to go in there, and they, I, I thought that they were going to treat me like they've been treating Sister Ramsey and go in there and do all kind of surgical stuff. And, so I went in, the doctor, and they said, before we do this, it's highly likely we're going to have to go in, but before we do this, we want to send you to rehab. And when we get there, uh, we're going to see if they can help you, and if that doesn't work, we'll have to go in. So when um, I went to the first day of rehab, um, I'm kind of a normal-sized person, 5'10", and I walked in there, and there was this lady that was at least 7'10". I'm fairly broad-shouldered, but I felt like a little boy with her. I mean, seven foot ten. This was Goliath's mother, all right? Shoulders this broad. And she, she laid me on the table, and I didn't know they did this kind of stuff. She started moving this arm and measuring. She had these rulers, and, and she's measuring my range of motion. And, and I was learning stuff. I was just asking questions, learning, because it's pretty. I did learn that I didn't have much motion, and I knew how much I didn't have. I knew it wasn't moving, but she proved to me that by numbers, all this was going on. And then she told me all that she was going to do to me. And then, <laughs> then she says, but before I do any of that to you, I want to do something real quick. She took my arm, and she just grabbed it, and she just threw it up. I mean, she just forced it up in the air. And I went, ah! <laughs> but whatever it was, she broke it loose. And immediately, I could lift my hand up. Now, it hurt. It hurt bad, but whatever it was. And so then she took me into this other little room, and some of you have been in this same kind of room before, to where that she had these two little ropes hanging on a pulley on the door. And my job was to stand here and do this and then do this and do this. And I would do it when we all pulled together, together, together. And I would have to do it like 200 times. And then she introduced me to the demon finger ladder. And some of you that's been in this before, it's a ladder, it's a wall that's little pegs, and you just put your finger here, and you just do this, and you walk your hand up to the top, and you hold it, and then you walk it back down. Uh, probably they're going to take this down off, off, the, off the church website after, after this wonderful illustration tonight. But um, so I was doing this, and, and literally, very quickly, I mean, I, I hated doing it. Oh, then they sit me down in front of this little bicycle. Not that you put your feet on and rode, but you rode, sit in a chair, and, and, and you rode the bicycle with your hands. And I felt, I felt childish. I felt, uh, I felt quite elderly all at the same time. I was the only one under 70 in there, and I was in my 40s at this time. And so <laughs> all of this was going on. And then with the last day, and they told me, you get to graduate, this is your last day. I never did, I never did grow friends with that finger ladder. I never did like that guy. And I started cheating. And my friend, the seven foot ten glass mom, she walked over and looked at me and looking at she says, Nope, you'll stay here until you do it. <laughs> so I started doing this. And I, I would take like three at a time. You know, take big steps. No, you don't skip steps. You, you do it. And I, I had to serve all of my time. I got no probation. I didn't get out early at all. I had to serve all of my days in prison. But she told me, you're not leaving until you do it. Even though, even though I was already fixed. Let me tell you something. When it comes to forgiveness, you're not going to get free. Until you do it. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. I mean, 
There was a religion that used to sell this thing called indulgences. And they would sell indulgences. And, and what would happen is if you had a huge sin, uh, you could go and confess your huge sin. And, and the priest would say if they were trying to raise money to, to, to build their church, a big church. It says if you, if, you, if you will pay a certain amount of money, we will sell you an indulgence. And by paying a certain amount of money and you buy this indulgence, you are forgiven of the sin. And so people would put large amounts of money so they would be forgiven of their sins and forgive their children's sins and everybody else's sins. They were buying indulgences to get a shortcut into heaven. It don't work. It does. There are no shortcuts into the kingdom of God. And if you think you're going to take a shortcut on a relationship with your brother or a relationship with your sister or a relationship with if you're going to find a shortcut, there is not one. It's not one. Don't ever think, don't you ever think for a minute, I got a way I can work this system with me and Jesus can work this system. No, you'll never play Jesus. You may manipulate me, you may manipulate the church, you may manipulate your spouse, you may manipulate your teacher, you might can manipulate your boss, you may manipulate your whole world, but you'll never manipulate God. And he will know if you were cheating when it was time to do the finger ladder. Nope, you skipped a step, he's gonna know. He's going to know if you took a shortcut when it was time to lean in that pain and, and go past that scar tissue and break that thing. He's going to know if you took a shortcut. And so I'm simply going to say no shortcuts. And instead, instead, offer mercy. Instead, offer humility. Instead, have a spirit of humility. Instead, let pride go out of your life. Instead, all of the works of the flesh, release them and submit yourself to God and learn to pray in the Holy Ghost and walk in the Spirit and save yourself from an untoward generation and work out your salvation with carefulness with God. But you can't find a shortcut. I mean, somebody here today, Matt, could write us a $100,000 check, and that's going to fix my problems. No, 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 no. You know, and there's a lot of times people say, well, well, that family got money. They're going to get by with stuff. Let me tell you something. You may manipulate the system and get by with stuff in this world. You'll never get by it in God's world. You'll never get by it. He knows. He knows your insides. He knows your outsides. He knows your heart. He knows your motive. He knows your spirit. He knows all of that stuff. And if you think for a minute, you can say, God, I'm just going to skip a step on my little finger ladder of life trying to get through this difficult time. He's going to know if you skipped the step. He's going to know if you cheated. He's going to know. He's going to know. What does the Sunday school song says? Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little hands. Be careful, little eyes. Be careful, little mouth. Y'all ever sung that song before? For the Father up above is looking down in love. This don't feel like love, God, right now. You are making me behave. You are making me do this finger ladder. You are making me be humble. You are making me, you are making me do away with my, you are making me forgive. For the Father up above is looking. Hear me, church family. If there's anything, I want us to be righteous and holy. And I want there to be, I want there to be a spirit of, of holiness in this church. Let me just say it this way. We, we were doing something today, and we're, we're going to give you a handout here in a few days for the 21 days of prayer. And we, we were, we were kind of making our little list of, of days that we were going to do. We need kind of one or two more days. And I just offered something. How about we offered moral purity as something to pray for in this church? We need to pray that there's a spirit of moral purity on every person that's a member of this church, everyone that's connected and indirectly to this church, and folks that's coming in the direction to this church. There be moral purity in this church. I mean, and that's not just living above sin. That's careful what you're looking at and careful what you're listening to because the Father up above is looking down in love. But don't you ever forget, your mama loves you, and that's why she beat the stew out of you while you were growing up. And God loves you, and he's not going to let you get by with garbage. Stand with me. Hey, man, if I keep this up, I'm going to start stomping and hollering at you, and y'all don't want me to do that. Be careful. And whatever you do, whatever you do, don't get caught in the prison 
of unforgiveness. Don't be caught in a prison where you don't offer mercy to somebody. Don't. The times that, that grace has come into our lives, I have marveled when it came. And only to be reminded later the reason this came. You remember when? Remember when you showed this great mercy? This is why you're reaping this today. I want to be right. Master, Lord, I pray in this room that there be a spirit of purity and a mercy upon every one of us. I pray, Lord, that honor and integrity be upon every man and woman in this church. I pray that righteousness and holiness be upon every family. And I pray, Lord, that even our youth, that they be able to rise above the temptations of their flesh. Guard our families, I pray, in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that mercy continue and grace abound and your goodness be manifest in each of us and in this church. But, Lord, let let us do our part. Lord, let us, Lord, respond correctly. Let us do, Lord, and show forth the works of the works of repentance and the meats of repentance in our lives. Oh God, have your way with us, we pray. Have your way with us in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We love you, Lord. We love you. Amen. It's almost time to go. And I just want to thank you for being faithful. But I want righteousness.